Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If I could ask you uh, to please uh, take your seats before we commence the ceremony, could I also ask you to ensure that your phones are switched to airplane mode? Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the rededication ceremony of the headstone of Abel Seaman Thomas Wellsby Clark. I would like to commence the ceremony by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, the Yamachi peoples, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also pay my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have contributed to the defence of Australia in times of peace and war. Mr Colin Clark, nephew of Abel Seaman Thomas Clark, the Honourable Matt Keogh MP, Minister for Defence Personnel and Veterans Affairs, 
Mr. Rob Hall, representing His Worship, the Mayor of Geraldton, Mr. Shane Van Stin, Vice Admiral Michael Noonan, AO, Chief of Navy, and Ms. Samantha Highway, Mr. Don Spinks, AM, President of the Repatriation Committee of the Department of Veterans Affairs, Brigadier Tim Bayliss, AM, Acting Director of Wargraves at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, on the 19th of November, 1941, the light cruiser HMAS Sydney, the second Royal Australian Navy warship to bear the name, was returning to Fremantle, having escorted the troop ship Zealandia to Sunda Strait in what was then the Dutch East Indies. At about 4 p.m., in a position some 200 kilometers west of Shark Bay, Sydney sighted a merchant ship and closed to investigate. When signaled, the merchant ship claimed to be the Dutch freighter Strait Malacca, but in reality, she was the disguised and heavily armed German merchant raider Cormoran. The German raider had already sunk several Allied merchant ships in the Indian Ocean and had over 300 sea mines on board that she was preparing to lay in the shipping lanes. For reasons which can never be explained, Sydney closed within one kilometer of the raider before demanding she provide her secret signal code. Cormoran did not have this code and quickly hoisted the German battle ensign and opened fire on Sydney. In the ensuing battle, both ships were badly damaged and broke off the action. Sydney sank later that night while attempting to reach the Australian coast. Cormoran was disabled and with the fires on board out of control, she was scuttled by her crew. Over 300 men from the German raider survived to become prisoners of war, but of Sydney's ship's company of 645 men, not a single man survived. Apart from a battle-damaged Carly float, which can now be seen on display in the Australian War Memorial, and an empty life jacket, no sign of the cruiser or her men were found in the initial searches. On the 6th of February, 1942, however, Another battle-damaged Carly float was found floating off Christmas Island, but with the body of a deceased naval rating in it. This sailor was buried in the old European cemetery at Christmas Island and remained there until his body was exhumed by a Royal Australian Navy team on the 30th of September 2006. Extensive analyses of the remains were undertaken, including mitochondrial and Y-chromosome DNA testing, which in late 2021, concluded beyond doubt that the sailor was able seaman Thomas Wellesby Clark of Brisbane, Queensland. Able seaman Thomas Wellesby Clark was born in the Brisbane suburb of New Farm on the 28th of January, 1920. He was the third son of the wealthy grazier, James Colin Clark and his wife, Marion Wellesby. She was descended from Scottish immigrants who came to the colony of Victoria in the early 1850s. James was the eldest son of the wealthy businessman, James Clark, who was an orphan who had risen from abject poverty to become one of the richest men in Queensland due to hard work and wise business investments. Thomas was educated at Slade School in Warwick, Queensland, and was an excellent swimmer and keen yachtsman. After leaving school, he became a clerk in the family firm, the pastoral company Clark and Tate. On the 14th of March 1939, he joined the militia and served as a part-time soldier in the 61st Battalion, the Queensland Cameroon Highlanders. On the 23rd, 23rd of August 1940, he enlisted in the Royal Australian Navy as an ordinary seaman and trained as a torpedo and anti-submarine rating. He served in the anti-submarine training ship HMAS St Giles during October 1940 through to July 1941, when he was promoted to able seaman and then joined HMAS Sydney in August 1941. On his final leave in Brisbane, before joining the cruiser, he became engaged to his sweetheart, Miss Anne Chandler. Able Seaman Thomas Clark was posted missing in action on the 20th of November 1941. His remains were subsequently, subsequently interred at this spot on the 19th of November 2008 as an unknown serviceman from HMAS Sydney 2. Today, a new headstone bears his name and his rank and his long journey home is finally over. And I call upon Principal Chaplain Lewis uh, to provide the opening prayer.
In times of reflection, people of faith normally include prayer. If this is you, I invite you to join me in prayer. Otherwise, may these words be edifying as you reflect this sombre afternoon on the sacrifices of the men of HMAS Sydney, and in particular, Abel Seaman Thomas Wellesby Clark. Heavenly Father, we come together to remember those who served in HMAS Sydney on that fateful evening in November 1941. The 645 who were lost that night and never returned to their loved ones. We honour their courage and remember their devotion to duty. They depended on one another in life and in death they were not divided. Bless those who have endured the lifelong grief of those lost and all sailors and families affected by the horrors of war. We pray that the scourge of war never again visits our seas and oceans and may we find rest in your eternal peace. Today, we especially remember Abel Seaman Thomas Wellesby Clark. We ask for your comfort and peace for Thomas's nephew, Colin, and all those whom the memory of A.B. Clark and the ship's company of HMAS Sydney are reminded of their own loss. 645 brave men were lost that night. One man was found. And today we finally declare that search for this one man is complete. Thomas Wellesby Clark, you are named, honoured and remembered this day. We commend into your hands, most merciful Father, the soul of our brother Thomas, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. These things we ask in your precious name. Amen. If I could call upon uh, Minister Keogh, the Minister for Defence Personnel and for Veterans Affairs. Uh... I'd like to acknowledge, of course, that we're joined by many distinguished guests here today, including uh, Rod Hall on behalf of the Mayor of Geraldton, the Chief of Navy, Vice Admiral Mike Noonan, Commanding Officer from HMAS Sterling, Captain Lawton, Warrant Officer of the Navy, Deb Butterworth, a Defence Attaché from the Federal Republic of Germany, Lieutenant Colonel Alois Wagner, and of course, Colin Clark, the nephew of Thomas Wellesby Clark. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we are here on the traditional lands of the Yamaji people here in Geraldton. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that have served and continue to serve our nation with great distinction, particularly any who join us here today. It's my great pleasure to be here today to officially unveil this headstone and dedicate the grave of formerly unknown HMAS Sydney sailor, Abel Seaman, Thomas Wellesby Clark. When a person signs up and serves in our ADF, their family serves alongside them, often making great sacrifices themselves. The death of a member of the ADF and the death of a loved one in war is a huge price for a family and for a community to pay. Today, I want, I want to not only pay tribute to Abel Seaman, with Thomas Wellesby Clark, but to his family who have waited more than 80 years to learn what happened to him, as well as to Abel Seaman Clark's comrades in arms, the, four, the other 644 sailors on HMAS Sydney, and whose graves remain the sea, and the full story of their bravery we will yet never know. So in this instance, the identification and location of Thomas Wellesby Clark has even greater significance as it enables us to provide a place to focus our memory, a place to return and to pay our respects to not only Abel Seaman Clark, but to all those that served alongside him. Today, we acknowledge the service and sacrifice of Abel Seaman Clark through inscription of his name upon this new Commonwealth war grave headstone. This is a significant recognition, a mark of the appreciation and respect offered by our nation to those who serve in the armed forces during wartime. Today, the Australian government is proud to honour Thomas, to recognise his service on HMAS Sydney and to pay respects to his family and to also acknowledge their sacrifice. 
The resolution of this 80-year mystery of Thomas Clark's identity was revealed in November last year, following extensive DNA research and the ADF's determination to lay this sailor properly to rest. Our thanks go not only to the significant advances that have been made in relation to DNA analysis, but also to the many hours of work and perseverance by staff, volunteers, and many interested parties that have assisted in identifying Thomas's remains for his family, including the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA within the University of Adelaide, researchers, archivists, and historians from the Sea Power Centre, Australia and Naval Historical Society of Australia, forensic staff of the Australian Federal Police, the Department of Veterans Affairs, members of the HMAS Sydney Association, the Christmas Island community, and staff of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, in collaboration with the Geraldton War Cemetery and many others. Today's commemoration reminds us that our nation's enduring relationship to the sea, for our prosperity, for our security, for our connections to friends, neighbours and allies. It reminds us that HMAS Sydney was sunk in action, protecting Australia, but ultimately successful in her mission. Sydney and her crew fought a capable enemy in a desperate struggle and a terrible price was paid. Let us offer our thanks and remembrance to all of those who made the ultimate sacrifice in the service of our country. Let us also remember and acknowledge the hurt and suffering of those they loved and left behind. Thomas did his duty. He did not relent. He did not give in. He is gone, but not forgotten. Thomas reminds us of the need to be courageous. We must not substitute words for action. Rather, face difficulty head on, to stand up and be counted in the face of adversity. In youth and strength and loyalty, Thomas Clark gave everything we can ever hope to give, his sacrifice for our safety. Today, we also reflect on the heartache of those he loved and cherished, the family he left behind. We must pause and remember in war the cost, risk and tragedy are beyond calculation. As our current serving personnel embark on training, exercises and operations, we reflect on just how important our Defence Force is and was back then in 1941 to the security and prosperity of our nation as we now know it today. Today we acknowledge and thank Thomas for his service in paying the ultimate sacrifice for our country, lest we forget. Thank you, Minister. Uh, could I call upon uh, Vice Admiral Noonan uh, now for his remarks, please? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I too uh, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands that we meet on today, the Imagiri people, and I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. And I too acknowledge the service of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in our Defence Force during times of peace and conflict. The Minister of Veteran Affairs and Defence Personnel, the Honourable Mr Matt Keogh, MP, uh, the President of the Repatriation Committee, Mr Don Spinks, AM. Don, great to have you here today. To the Acting Director of War Graves and the Department of Veteran Affairs, Brigadier Tim Bayless, AM. Thank you for all you have done in making today possible. Of course, the nephew of Thomas Wellsby Clark, Colin Clark. Thank you. To the people and the... Uh, representatives of the Mayor and the Council of, of the Greater City of Geraldton, thank you for all you do uh, in preserving uh, this beautiful place, this important place, and honouring those that have come before us. My good friend, the Warrant Officer uh, Marty Grogan, OAM, uh, representing the HMAS Sydney Association, I've known 
Marty, for most of my career, uh, and he has been a relentless champion uh, of campaigning, not just for HMAS Sydney, but for all service people. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Finding Sydney Foundation and the director, Commodore Bob Trotter, OAM, who's here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, most importantly, uh, the family of Abel Seaman Clark, who are not with us today in person, but are with us in spirit and through technology. And I'm proud that we're able to live stream this event uh, to our friends and family, not just in Australia, but around the world today. It's important as we all gather here to unveil this beautiful new headstone for him here at the Geraldton War Cemetery. As you've heard, just over 80 years ago on the 19th of November, 1941, a very desperate sea battle took place some 200 kilometres west of where we are standing right now. This, of course, was the famous battle between HMAS Sydney and the disguised raider, the Cormoran. Both ships were badly damaged and eventually sank. And in Sydney's case, the entire ship's company of 645 men perished, making this the largest loss of life that the Australian Navy has ever experienced in a single day. Not since the carnage of the Western Front during World War I had so many Australians been killed in a single action. While some have called the action a disaster, this is patently untrue, as Sydney's crew did sink the cormorant and thus removed a very dangerous enemy from our waters. If cormorant had escaped, she would have wreaked havoc upon our shipping, the lifeblood of our nation. The action to destroy her was a victory, but a very bittersweet victory indeed. It was made even more bitter by the fact that not a single man from Sydney survived and that apart from a battle-scarred Carly float and an empty life jacket recovered 300 kilometres off Carnarvon by HMAS heroes a week after Sydney had been sunk, nothing else was found in the subsequent search for survivors. However, as we've heard some three months later in February 1942, another damaged Carly float was spotted by coast watchers stationed on South Point the southernmost tip of Christmas Island. This Carly float had drifted within visual distance of Christmas Island, some 2,500 kilometres from where the sea battle had taken place. In the raft was the body of a deceased naval rating wearing blue overalls that had been bleached white by the sun in some places. His body was brought ashore by the Christmas Islanders and a few days later, he was given a military burial and a funeral in the old European cemetery on the western side of the island overlooking Flying Fish Cove. A report detailing the life raft and the body it contained was sent to the Royal Australian Navy. But in late March 1942, Christmas Island was invaded by Japanese forces and nothing could be done to investigate the report. The matter of the unknown sailor of Christmas Island was first raised in 1949, but no action was taken. And it was not until the early 1890s, sorry, 1980s, that the matter was again raised when two books on the loss of Sydney were written. Among the many readers was Mr. Ted McGowan, whose older brother had been lost in Sydney. And he and others lobbied the Australian government to have the remains of the unknown sailor exhumed. In 2001, as a commander in Navy headquarters, I initiated a search led by Lieutenant Commander Richard Chartier to find the grave. Unfortunately, due to misinformation about the location of the grave site and a combination of steep ground, heavy undergrowth, natural soil movements and extremely heavy annual rainfall, this search proved fruitless. A second search in late 2006 was successful and the remains were returned to Australia for examination, which included DNA testing. Despite significant 
genealogical research and scientific analysis, the remains of the unknown sailor could not be identified. And on the 19th of November, 2008, he was buried here at the Geraldton War Cemetery as an unknown serviceman. This was because Sydney had Royal Australian Navy, Royal British, uh, British personnel, Royal Australian Air Force personnel and civilian canteen staff on board when she was lost. He was an unknown serviceman. For while he had been buried, the unknown sailor had not been forgotten and a dedicated teams of researchers, some who are here with us today, continued to conduct DNA testing and research, often in their own time, to identify him. In 2007, when the initial DNA testing was done by the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA at Adelaide University, only microbiable DNA could be extracted from the bones. This DNA can last for hundreds of years and follows the female line of family genetics. The male DNA, the Y or nuclear DNA, breaks down more quickly and the scientific techniques available in 2007 were unable to extract male DNA for analysis. A portion of bone was remained, was retained and held safe at the Sydney University where anthropological analysis was completed by Dr. Dennis Donlan, as the expectation was that the DNA science would improve over time and enable further analysis. Indeed, many of the improvements in DNA analysis are related to identifying victims of the September 11, 2001 attacks, as remains were still being found in obscure areas long after the incidents themselves. And many of these fragments required significantly improved analysis to enable positive identification. In late 2020, using the new scientific methods, the team at the Australian Federal Police Laboratory were able to extract the Y DNA from the retained bone. Navy used the two sets of DNA data to track down both female line only descendants and male line only descendants. This led in both cases to Thomas Wellsby Clark, as Tom was the only HMAS Sydney sailor who appeared on both family trees. This was also corroborated by his anthropology, including his height, his age data, jaw shape, and the many gold fillings he had, indicating that he came from an affluent family. Mrs. Tony White, the geologist used by the Army under unrecovered war casualties section confirmed the family tree findings. These results were checked by two independent genealogists who also confirmed that the family tree data was in fact correct. The final DNA puzzle was resolved through a match of the DNA of Abel Seaman Thomas Wellsby Clark to that of his nephew, Mr. Colin Clark, who was here with us today. It was that DNA match that finally resolved the case, indicating a 99.98% match to Thomas Wellsby Clark using both sets of DNA. The unknown sailor had finally been positively identified. As we've heard, Thomas was born in Brisbane in January 1920. He attended school in Warwick and the sister school, St Catherine's, were independent Anglican schools established in the 1900s. His father was indeed a wealthy grazier and his grandfather was an astute businessman who had risen from being an orphan and born and thrust into abject poverty to become one of the richest men in Queensland. As we've heard, his mother was of Scottish ancestry and her family arrived in Ballarat in the early 1850s and witnessed the fighting at the Eureka Stockade. Tom was tall and lean and an excellent sportsman, excelling in swimming and sailing. After leaving school, he worked as a clerk in the family company of Clark and Tate, which managed pastoral properties. In early 1939, the war clouds were on the horizon and he did join the militia. 
a forerunner to today's Army Reserve. And he was a private in the 61st Battalion of the Queensland Cameron Highlanders. In August 1940, he joined the Royal Australian Navy and trained as a torpedo and anti-submarine rating. Following service in the anti-submarine training ship, HMAS St Giles, he was promoted to the Rabel Seaman and joined HMAS Sydney in August 18, 1941. On his last leave home to Brisbane, he became engaged to his sweetheart, Miss Anne Chandler, and was a nurse, a keen swimmer and a body surfer. And they had met through Tom's swimming and sailing activities. Mr. Commander Greg Swindon spoke with Anne's granddaughter, who related that Anne did not marry until well after the end of World War II, when it was confirmed that there was no survivors from HMAS Sydney. Hopes were held by many at that time that some crew members might have been held captive by the Japanese, but this was not the case. We don't know where in Sydney Tom was serving during her action with the Cormoran, but we do know that he was wounded as a German shell fragment was found embedded in his remains. We don't know who was with him in the life raft, but a report written in 1942 by the Christmas Islanders indicated that there may have been another man with him as a boot, which could not have fitted Tom, was also found in the raft. It has taken over 80 years for Tom to make the long journey home from the noise and the smoking, choking smoke of his burning ship off the Western Australian coast to the peace and tranquility of the Geraldton War Cemetery. His long voyage is over and he can now truly rest in peace. I would like to conclude with a short Scottish poem in honour of Tom's family heritage. Last night I dreamed a deadly dream beyond the Isle of Skye. I saw a dead man win a fight and I think that man was I. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today to recognise and celebrate the life of our sailor, Abel Seaman Thomas Wellsby Clark. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next part of the ceremony is the wreath laying. If I could call upon the Minister for Defence, Personnel and Veterans Affairs to lay the first wreath, please. Vice Admiral Noonan representing the Royal Australian Navy.
Mr. Tom Speaks, representing the Department of Peasants Affairs. Brigadier Tim Bayless, representing the Commonwealth Group Postage. Ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to please stand now for the uh, odes and the national anthem. They have no grave but the cruel sea. No flowers rest at their head. A rusting hulk is their tombstone, a fast on the ocean bed. They shall not grow old as we to the left grow old. Age shall not weary then, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.
lest we forget. Principal Chaplain Lewis to offer the final blessing, please. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with kindness and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, to conclude our ceremony this afternoon, the Chief of Navy would like to present an Australian white ensign to Mr. Colin Clark. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our ceremony this afternoon. We'd be delighted if you could join us at the Yacht Club uh, in Geraldton. Uh, if anybody would like assistance with transport, we can, we can help you there. Uh, and that uh, afternoon tea will start at 14.30. Thank you very much indeed for your attendance today. Thank you.